Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this webinar by the Institute of Leadership and Management. My name is Nicholas Lynch. I'm a consultant working with the Institute, and I'm going to chair today's uh, webinar. Before we get started, just want to go over a couple of items so you know how to participate in today's event. Um, you'll have joined the presentation using your computer speaker system by default. If you prefer to, to phone in, just select telephone in the audio pane and you can dial in. Uh, you'll see the dial in information there. You have the opportunity to submit text questions for today's presenter by typing your questions in the questions pane of the control panel. You can send in these questions anytime during the presentation and we'll collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end uh, of the presentation. Um, as you may know, this is the latest webinar uh, on the Institute of Leadership and Management's Dimensions of Leadership. The Institute has identified five dimensions of leadership, vision, achievement, authenticity, ownership and collaboration. And it's collaboration today that we're going to, uh, we're going to look at in, in a little bit of detail. Um, as you can see, collaboration has several um, sort of sub-elements within it, um, and it links, there we are, and it links um, both to how leaders operate internally within their organization, or also how they um, work out uh, externally within the organization. And the topic we're going to focus on today is negotiating. So I'm very pleased to introduce Alison Mathias. She's a director of Equal2 Limited and Corporate Director at the Association of Professional Sales. As Head of Sales Academy at CPM UK, um, which is Europe's largest field marketing agency, Alison has been responsible for negotiating, consulting and developing sales and leadership programs for blue chip field sales teams and contact centers internationally. She has a passion for tracking ROI and creating meaningful and lateral behavioral change, um, which has led her to found Equal2 Limited to spend time researching, developing innovative techniques that stand the test of today's challenging and changing workplace. Alison has teamed up with like-minded academics to create innovative and research-led ideas for developing teams involved in influencing, managing, selling, and negotiating. So she's very well placed indeed to talk to us today around collaboration, negotiating. Alison, can I hand over to you? Yes, thank you very much, Nick, and hello, everyone. And uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the next 20, 25 minutes of considering um, collaboration in the context of negotiating. And uh, clearly, we could spend a lot longer than 25 minutes talking about this topic. So um, I'm going to attempt to just hone in on some of the really key areas uh, that I think will be of use to you. But of course, at the end, you have the opportunity, or well, if you have some questions throughout, you can make a note and we'll have the opportunity to answer maybe some of the questions that you have, or you can get in touch with me afterwards to, to you know, uh, di dive into some of the other topics in a bit more detail. So, um, collaboration is the, is the area, negotiating is the theme for tonight. And I guess one of the things I wanted to start with is, uh, the fact that a collaborative leader always aims for win-win outcomes when they're having to negotiate. And as leaders, you must be aware of the fact that you know, we negotiate almost every day in lots of different ways. So, you know, the, the big negotiations, there's a particularly big one going on at the moment, we might be aware of, which is Brexit. Uh, big contract negotiations, there might be negotiations we have to do commercially that make the big difference to us and to our maybe our companies. Um, but when we negotiate with our teams, when we negotiate with our colleagues, we may even negotiate with our teenagers at home. So having a collaborative approach as a leader, um, which means having a win-win outcome, is really critical. And we're going to talk about three things. We're going to talk about why it, a collaborative approach or win-win approach is important. We're going to talk about preparation. And we're going to talk a little bit about the behaviours that we need to display to make this successful. So first of all, what do we mean by win-win negotiating and what is negotiation? Um, and it usually involves two really important things. One is the skillful use of assertiveness, which is a word that has been misunderstood. And I mean, through my, throughout my career, I've heard people talk about assertiveness in all kinds of different ways. And it's usually, mm, you were a bit assertive. Um, and that's not what we mean by assertiveness. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about that later on. But it's about the skillful use of assertiveness in order to achieve a win-win outcome with between ourselves and another party. And a really great way of describing it actually comes from someone called Kel Jensen. And Kel is a specialist in uh, negotiation, trust, and behavioral economics. 
very successful Scandinavian uh, business leader, and, and he defines it this way. He says, negotiation is a psychological game played between people. It's a game whose rules you must come to know if you are to succeed. You must know how we influence one another. You must learn to decline gracefully and how to test limits, but without ruining relationships. You need to know when it's worth the time and effort to negotiate and when it's better to accept the situation as it is. So as you can see, it's kind of alluding to the fact that negotiation isn't this idea of um, winning and losing. So, you, you know, on TV, we see like hostage negotiation, or we might think about the hardball negotiators having power and coming away winning and the victors. But actually, specialists in this area talk about it more as a psychology. It's about understanding the rules. He's talking about being able to influence people. And then when we do say no, saying no or declining with grace or gracefully without ruining relationships. And sometimes it's about walking away from a negotiation or really do we need to be negotiating here at all or is it something a little bit more than that as a leader? So we're gonna explore that in a little bit more detail. Consider uh, what I just talked about there, which was the maybe the, the more well-known or the old and traditional view of negotiation. Often, no, well, we're calling it win-lose, but it's also known as distributive negotiation. Now, distribu distributive negotiation is an approach that kind of assumes that there's a finite amount of, uh, of resources. So it's a splitting up of the pie. It's a, we have so much money on the table, we're going to negotiate to see if one person can come away with more than the other. And what that tends to do is put us in a situation where there's us and the other people are our opponents. So if we're in this buying situation, the other person will get more of my money or less of my money. One person comes away the victor, one person comes away uh, the loser. And that's where if we're taking that approach to negotiation, we'll be very much sitting in the concern for what I get out of it or what my team gets out of it. And satisfying my needs is the important thing here, and the other person's needs is secondary. Now, the problem with this form of negotiation in the collaborative leadership environment is that the kind of strategies that we employ to, uh, for a win-lose kind of negotiation are things, as you're going to see at the bottom there, like manipulation, pushing, forcing, um, withholding information, so cards close to your chest, um, need to know basis, and um, and those types of qualities are not going to be the kinds of qualities that you'll have heard up until now that are useful for someone in a leadership position. So what we have to think about there is the consequences of applying that form of negotiation in your day-to-day -day life. You see, even if it's a client and we are talking about money, at the end of the day, we probably need to work with those people over a period of time. When we leave the negotiation room or the negotiation meeting, we then have to put those things into effect and we have to live with that. And what will happen is that if someone comes away feeling like they've lost, they will behave like they've lost, which means they're probably not going to engage in working with us in the way that's going to help either them or us. Um, unless we are in a sort of hostage, hostage negotiation situation or maybe we're on a market and we're selling something and we never need to see that person again or we're in a bazaar, maybe that's appropriate. But in today's leadership environment, it's not likely to be the, the best way to deal with people. What we're looking for is a more integrative approach and that's the, the stuff you see there on, on the right. Um, and that's where we understand that it's not a finite resource we're talking about that we believe that both sides can win if only we can find a solution that's about value added. So there's, it's not just about money or a, 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 a dividing of the pie, but it's about how we're gonna to come together to work together so both people walk away with a win. Um, so things like uh, flexible working hours, that's a win-win situation. So someone might say, I need to leave at a certain time. You might think, well, it's nine to five here. We need, I need you to work those seven or eight hours. Um, but if you sit down and think about flexible working times or peak times where the employer gets the amount of work and results that they need and the employee uh, are, are able to suit their needs, then that's a win-win situation. So that's the kind of thing we're talking about. Um, and those strategies or the behaviours involved here are cooperation, sharing information, and this is key really, mutual problem solving. Because actually negotiation is always a problem that needs solving. And if you have a win-lose scenario, you don't solve a problem, you just shift the problem to the other person. 
if we're going to work together as a leader uh, or a leader team or work with clients, what we want is to solve problems uh, so that both parties walk away feeling they've got something out of it. So uh, we're not the only people that have come up with this idea. It's been around for a while. In fact, if you've ever read Steve, uh, Stephen Covey's Seven Habits, he talks about win-win solutions an awful lot. In fact, he may have even coined the phrase. Uh, and he said, with a win-win solution, all parties feel good about the decision and feel committed to the action plan. Win-win sees life as a cooperative, not a competitive arena. And that, the key there really is that everyone's committed to the action plan. So whatever takes place, everybody's happy to, to work wholeheartedly in. Just realized I can't actually see the uh, one second. Um, so, the other uh, quote here is from N uh, Nimala Reddy, and um, Nimala works with uh, emerging economies and has to negotiate all the time um, as, as uh, part of her work there. And she says that negotiation is not about one party, party winning and the other party losing and uh, making it a total zero sum. Instead, two or more parties come to the table for a conversation. They discuss their interests and create an exchange to create mutual benefits for each other. So hopefully you're getting the idea that collaborative negotiation is about understanding how to balance what we need with what the other person needs so that we come away with more than we started with and with groups of people or both parties committed to the solution that we came up with. So that's what uh, collaborative negotiation is, and that's why it's so important. And by the way, there are all kinds of studies that, if you were interested, that show that collaborative negotiations and collaborative and trust-based agreements and economies are always more competitive commercially. And even countries who have high levels of collaboration and trust, their GDP is generally speaking higher. So there's lots of studies to show that this, even from a selfish point of view, is the best way forward uh, for leadership in today's business. So the second point was uh, preparing for a negotiation. And I thought I would share with you uh, an experience that I had. Um, there, obviously, I've, I've been in lots of different negotiation situations, a lot of them to do with sales and a lot, of them, a lot of them to do with contracts. But I think the one that sticks in my mind was a little smaller than that. And that was when uh, a little while ago we won a really large project. It was a consulting project with a large uh, automotive manufacturer. And we were going out to all of their dealerships with a finite amount of time to get this project done in. And I didn't have a team that was big enough. And so we needed to recruit some more people from the wider business and also some people from externally. We found a candidate who was brilliant. She was amazing. She had all the right qualities and uh, the right background and, and the right understanding to be part of the project. Now, I had um, a finite budget and also I was up against a deadline. We had made a commitment to a client. I needed enough people to roll the project out. And here was someone who looked like the ideal candidate, except the problem that needed negotiating to, solve, to, to be solved was that she wanted uh, to be paid about £10,000 more than I had one authority to be able to give or two felt comfortable with. Um, but Obviously, I needed to get this person on board if possible because we were, we were in that situation. And so um, we needed to enter into a salary negotiation. And that's probably something that we're all going to have to do at some point or another. And in order to solve that problem and to, to negotiate successfully, I knew that I needed to do some preparation. And the reason I needed to do preparation is because of this fact. Human beings were considered for a while to be thinking machines that also felt but neuroscience is now telling us that we are feeling machines that also think. And what that means is that when we get into a negotiation situation where we have something at stake, where we feel really strongly about the outcome, our feelings and our emotions can often take over and it can be very difficult for us to behave the way we want to behave and get the results we want to get unless we are fully prepared. So, one of the things that you really need to think about when you get preparing for a negotiation is to know what you need to know. And in particular, you need to know what you need to know about the other party. Now, if you've got paper and pen there and if you are taking notes, I'd just like to share with you five key things that I think you should always brainstorm before any, uh, before any negotiation. The first one is, what does the person I'm negotiating with value? What are their values? And what I mean by values is, what do they really, at their core, live for, make a stand over, walk away from, um, would make take a stand over? 
uh, they're the things that, that will, will always be. So your values are the things that you hold true to regardless. Things like uh, the need for autonomy, the need for growth, uh, the need for honesty, the need for control, things that are, we value as people, but also companies have values. And the values uh, will vary depending on the kind of company a person is a part of or the, the party is a part of. So for example, a public sector organization will have very different values possibly to private, or a, a not large corporate organization will have very different values to an, a small SME or an individual. So what you need to do is first of all, understand the values. And I had to do that when I entered my negotiation, which I'll tell you about in a minute. The second thing that you really need to brainstorm and understand is what motivates that group or that person. So the difference between values and motivation is your values will always hold true, they're at your core, but your motivations are expressed that they are the immediate things. So for example, if uh, you're motivated by being successful, uh, sorry, your value is about being successful and being the best you can be, you might be motivated in the moment by uh, salary, or it might be by uh, putting yourself out of your comfort zone, or you might be motivated by winning a piece of business or hitting a target. So people and groups will be motivated. The organizations can be motivated by the market changes. They can be motivated by a target they've been given by their shareholders or by their boss. So values first, but also what's motivating them at the moment? Is it net profit? Is it uh, showcasing something? Whatever it might be. The third thing, um, is, is to understand what their attitude towards the topic is and their history with it, which will form their attitude. Usually things don't happen in isolation. So you normally come to a negotiation position with some context. So finding out what the context and the journey here and what attitudes that has left people with is really important because when you put your idea forward, if they have an, a negative attitude or they've switched off or they're closed minded about a particular area, they might not be able to hear you or accept it or be open to change. But if you understand what that is before you start, you can uh, you can speak about that and maybe sort that out before you get to the solution. Um, the fourth thing is what questions or concerns might they have for exactly the same reason? What, what things do they need answering? What uh, barriers do they need moving? And what concerns might they have about you, about your organization or about the solution you know you're about to present? So have a think about those things and tackle them up front. And the final thing is, of all of those things, what do they care about the most and what do they care about least? The reason that's important is if once you've done that brainstorm, you, you're going to be coloured and biased by what you think is important. But if you're going to be successful in any negotiation and be collaborative with the other person, you need to understand and have empathy for what's important to them. And my final point on that is um, try and discuss it with somebody else just to make sure that you haven't missed anything and just to make sure that you're not allowing your own emotions and bias to get in the way. So when it says be knowledgeable, be knowledgeable about the people that you're going to be going into negotiation with. The next thing, of course, is to be knowledgeable about yourself. What is it I want? What is my clear goal? What is my objective? What would I de ideally, best case scenario, want to come out with? And, and, and what am I willing to give away in order to get there? I need to understand also what my weak areas are, what my disadvantages are. So for example, with the, with the salary negotiation I was getting into, I needed to understand, first of all, what was important to uh, my candidate, but I also needed to uh, be aware of the fact that I was under pressure because I had a time uh, deadline and I also had a budget deadline, a profit deadline, and I also had a team I needed to make sure that they were able to gel with. So my weak or my disadvantage here was I was kind of on the back foot and, I, and, and so I needed to be upfront and honest about that, um, but I also needed to be aware of it so that I wasn't put on the back foot during if it came up in the conversation. So know what the other party wants the most, know your disadvantage, Know what you're happy to give away in order to get what you both need, but also understand what your walk away threshold is. So if it gets to the point where they won't budge or it just isn't solvable, you need to understand at which point you can walk away from that negotiation and maybe revisit it another time. Maybe you need to go away and think about it, get more creative and come back to the party. But what you don't want to do is concede something that's really important to you. And if you haven't done your preparation, that might take you by surprise. So preparation for negotiation is really important. And when I spoke to my candidate, what I found was um, actually her values were growth, but her values were also about uh, her the view of her community and her family. 
she, it was really important to her that she was seen as being successful. And what motivated her at the time was being seen as successful. And so salary was one way of doing that. In actual fact, the concerns she had was stagnating and not moving forward in her career and not taking a step forward in this new role. And so what I was able to do in my prep, so I, we just had a coffee to talk about that and I found those things out. And um, what I was able to do was give her a little bit more salary, but then at the same time help her to get onto our company scheme that gave us some accreditation and some education with a, a qualification at the end of it in her particular area that meant that her time with us was going to move her forward in her career. And with that, she was able to accept, happily accept, a slightly less salary than she'd come in with. And that was a, it was a really great win-win for us. And she was brilliant. So we talked about um, why, what collaboration is, um, collaborative negotiation is, and we've talked about the kinds of needs, uh, preparation that we need to do. Uh, what about the way we need to behave? So when we're, behave, when we're in our win -win, uh, negotiating for win-win conversation, um, the way we come over as a collaborative leader is critical for the outcome. And there's a whole heap of things on the slide here that are really great um, pieces of advice. Um, but what I would what I would say to you is that you need to make sure that you treat the other party with dignity. At the very beginning, we talked about um, declining with declining gracefully. The way you do a thing is going to be so much more influential on your outcome than what you're doing. So you could be saying no, or you could be saying, actually, I really uh, can see that you've done a lot of thinking in that um, and you've really put some thought into your uh, proposal. And I absolutely understand where you're coming from. Unfortunately, at this time, that's not going to quite meet uh, our objectives either. We might need to do a little bit more work on that. So you can just say no, that's ridiculous. Or you can say something that really gives people um, the, the feeling that you can still work together to come up with a solution. So a couple of things here, be empathetic. So that's doing that work around understanding who the other person is, but approaching the conversation in a positive and optimistic way. We're gonna sit down today and talk about a solution that works for both of us. Questioning obviously is really important, but with questioning, uh, guys, you really need to listen and listen between the lines. So what is going on here? What is it they really care about? listen out for the values listen out for their motivations and make sure that you test that you've understood them uh, before you move forward into the next phase of negotiation because unless you're both on the same page whatever you agree in that meeting isn't going to um, become successful later on um, also if you've um, identified any thorny areas or any you know weak spots for you or anything that's complex or, um, then try and deal with those things first and the reason for that is um, once they're done, then the rest of it can really fall to can move quite quickly. But if there is a, an elephant in the room um, and the likelihood is they'll know about it, too, then anything you discuss ahead of that isn't really going to be uh, solidly agreed because people in the back of their mind are going to be thinking about this, this complex issue. So get anything difficult or complex out of the way first. Establish your terms and conditions. For example, with the salary negotiation, we made sure that um, she understood that there was um, the terms for that, how long it was going to take, and what we would want in, in, um, in terms of tenure, what we would need from her in, in return, and the amount of time that you know she was going to spend at work doing that work, and how much of the, the time was going to be her in her own time. So making sure that you get into the details so everyone's clear and everything's out on the table. Treating the party with respect obviously goes without saying, um, but this is a, a really important point. Win-win negotiations are about long-term relationships. If you do, if you come in with a win-lose um, solution, you might win temporarily and you might benefit temporarily, but long-term you won't because people won't come back and work with you again. Your reputation will be tarnished. If you're collaborative and you take time to do this properly and make sure the other person walks away with something they need to, the long-term relationship will pay dividends, not only between you and that person or that you and that company, but in the way that they speak about you to other people. And in any negotiation, try and walk away with a consensus. Even if that consensus is we're almost there or we're partway there, we need to come back together and uh, again and discuss this in a bit more detail. And of course, just on, on that with behaviours, once you have walked away, make sure that it doesn't fall down uh, at the last hurdle. So if you're, if you're leading a negotiation with somebody, um, then making sure that what happens beyond that negotiation meeting 
is still going to reflect on you and it's still going to come under your leadership. So make sure that if somebody else is involved, uh, so you have other stakeholders in the game, that they understand not only what you've agreed, but why and why that's a benefit to you and them and why the win-win solution is so important. Make sure everybody knows what they need to do so their responsibilities are clear, when they're going to do it and what they're going to need is also laid out and that you make sure that you keep tapping in um, and that you keep monitoring that process and right the way to the end because as I said, it's your reputation and your leadership uh, on the line beyond the negotiation uh, because you were there at the beginning. So the other thing we said at the beginning was assertiveness was key. And I just before we finish, I just want to spend a couple of minutes talking about assertiveness, what it is and what it isn't. Christy Hedges talks about assertiveness being a quality commonly associated with leadership. As professionals move through the ranks, they're assessed for their ability to confidently state opinions and ask for what they want. When they aren't doing so, they may receive feedback that they don't show leadership potential, are too reserved or lack executive presence. So she gives some key clues really to what we mean by assertiveness. She talks about it being confidence, so the ability to confidently state an opinion and to ask for what we want. And it talks also about presence. Now, the dynamic for assertiveness and its role in negotiation um, is this. If we get into a situation where, especially if something's at stake and we want to come out on top, but also with the other person making sure that they walk away with value, we can't afford to be either passive or aggressive, but they're the opposite extremes of behavior that we find when we're in a negotiation situation. So if you're passive, we give away too much in negotiation or we give away the control of that negotiation to the other party. It's a lose win to them. If we're aggressive, what happens then is we feel we're losing and therefore we start to become controlling and bullying. Neither of these approaches is gonna give us the results that we need. Instead, what we want to do is be assertive, and that's about making sure we maintain lots of choice and we keep control, control of ourselves, control of the negotiation, and really clear about what it is that we want and we're able to articulate that in a confident way. This is where the preparation comes in. But the dynamic um, for that, let me just, oh, we've lost a, we've lost a slide here. Okay. Uh, so the dynamic for that is, is often in a quadrant. So I, I think we're gonna have to skip that part, but the, the assertiveness um, element of this is really important. Um, if you are making notes and you were to write, um, draw a, a quadrant on your piece of paper and at the top you have uh, power and I win. And at the bottom you have uh, submissiveness and I lose. And on the left you have, um, uh, cold and um, and on the right you have warm. Inside of these quadrants you will see uh, that on the top right hand corner at the top assertiveness uh, is where you are in power but you're being warm and, and it's an I, I win and I and you win scenario um, and because that slide has now disappeared from the deck and I don't know why I'm, I'm going to um, offer that out to the rest of you to have a look at um, in the future. But the point being is if we're assertive, we're making sure that we stay dominant and powerful about our stuff, but that we keep an eye on making sure that the other person walks away with all of their needs met as well. And that we take control of making sure that they do get what they need. So that when you walk away from that negotiation situation, um, both parties are committed to the outcome and you can work together for um, a mutual benefit. So final thoughts on this. Uh, from Shira Prosak. While there are many factors at play in negotiation, two of them have the greatest impact, preparation and communication. Balancing the two will set you up for success. When you head into a negotiation, knowing that you're prepared, you're able to communicate more freely and with greater impact. So make sure you prepare for your win-win uh, negotiation, otherwise you will be on a back foot and you won't end up behaving the way you want to and make sure that the way you communicate is with respect and with a clear eye on um, both parties getting what they need. So if you need any more information on any of this, there are references here in, in the pack um, and um, thank you so much for your attention. Great. Also, we just can I just throw out two very quick questions uh, to you? Um, yes. the, the, the first one is you've talked a lot about win-win but is it really possible to have a situation where both parties equally win? Isn't it inevitable that somebody is winning more than the uh, someone else? 
So I guess that depends on the value. Um, so if you walk away with everything that you need from uh, a negotiation, then you will feel like you've won. Um, if it's a finite amount of uh, resources, like I said to you before, if you're in a haggling situation, even then though, what we need to make sure is that the, we understand what the other person needs. So a win-win scenario is when um, you feel like you, you maybe you've got the deal and you've got it at a level of profit that you can live with, but the other person has walked away with a good deal and, and a really great feeling about you and therefore in the future you might get um, you'll get repeat business and you know and, and everybody wins so it's a bit like apples and oranges quite often so I, I would say that um, yes yeah, somebody might come away with a slightly better deal but so long as the other per party feels like they got a good deal and they want to work with you again they're committed to the outcome then both parties have won. Okay just a quick second question sort of follow up as you talked a lot about preparation and the things that we need to think about and so on but um, so much negotiation is sort of ad hoc yeah it's it's in the moment it's a daily one um, somebody's put here you know negotiating with children which you you mentioned yeah, yeah. Um, is it really possible to prepare for a lot of negotiation in the way that you've you've uh, you've suggested and maybe linked to that is are there certain skills we should be developing in order to do it yeah absolutely so um, with both children and also as leaders when you have direct reports um, for those day-to-day -day negotiations uh, it is about doing the groundwork all the time so you know what we would say in terms of uh, developing your skill set as a leader um, your most levels of emotional intelligence which is know yourself and know the other person um, is, is critical so getting to know values of the other person getting to understand what motivates them and being able to um, manage your own uh, state so that you can listen to someone and understand where they're at is, is critical i mean um you, you, there are loads of different ways you can do this that there are uh, so for example insights or myers-briggs are great frameworks if this is something you want to develop i would also say though that just make sure you spend time getting to know the people um, that you work with and negotiate with regularly uh, in the same way with the kids, uh, making sure that you spend time listening to how they really feel about things, who they are, you know, where they might be different to you, means that in the moment those ne negotiations will go better. There is, yeah. there is, there's no shortcuts. I'm afraid. You, you know, you, you, if you don't, if you come out with a good outcome uh, in negotiation and you haven't done that preparation, that was probably luck more than it happened to be quite similar. But that day-to-day -day interaction is is sort of preparation, if you see what I mean. You sort exactly. of preparation. yeah, absolutely. So you know, with when we when we talk about leadership, people management and, and leadership, it's about regularly setting aside time, not just to talk about the job or the task, um, yeah. but and talk to your team about who they are and what they care about and what's going on with them, um, and understanding. You know, making a note, write, literally writing down. Hmm, right, so they're motivated by being with. People, they're motivated by growth. They're really demotivated when they have to do a lot of detailed work. So I have to make sure that they manage that element of them or whatever it might be. So um, yeah, yeah, it's really important to do that all the time. Okay, great. I'm afraid we, we, we're we out of time or we've, we've run out of time. So um, just really thank you for taking you taking a, us through your presentation and um, answering our questions. And thanks to everyone who submitted a question. Sorry, we didn't get to, uh, to all of them. Um, just to remind everyone that uh, once this webinar is finished, you will receive a link where you can give feedback to um, uh, on the presentation. So it'd be great if you can complete that. And also within the next day or so, you'll, re you'll receive a link to a recording of the presentation so you can review it again and also um, see in more detail the, uh, the reference slide, for example. So I'm going to close the webinar now. Thanks everyone for, for dialing in and I'll wish you a very good evening. <laughs>